For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. That passage from Isaiah 9 says when the kingdom of Jesus is enacted that his peace will never end. The promise of a child born to us in this season of peace. Not, not the kind of peace where there's no war, but that kind of peace where we're whole. <clears throat> where our hearts are no longer broken. Where the broken pieces of our lives are reassembled by the grace of God. And that wholeness, that completeness in Christ, it never ends. It is a promise for today, for tomorrow, for all eternity. So we light the candle of peace on this second Sunday of Advent. Because right now we need more of that peace. That peace that never ends. <clears throat> Father God, we come to you today and we ask for the peace that passes all human understanding. A peace that is not dependent on our circumstances. A peace that isn't taken away by our problems. A peace that protects our hearts and minds. Because that child born to us now lives within us. Bring us that peace, its wholeness, its completeness. Because we are desperate for it today. We rejoice that you've given us this child that we might have peace in him. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Luke chapter 2, verse 14 tells us that the angels filled the sky above the shepherds after they had announced the birth of Jesus Christ. And they sang this song, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace on those whom his favor rests. We celebrate peace. And as the angels sang of that peace and what it meant for the world, we sing of that peace today in these Christmas songs and think of what it means for us in our lives. It came upon the midnight that glorious song of from angels bent.
Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 1, starting with verse 18. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will have a son and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, and she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until she, her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. I read of this study that was released in 2013, and it showed in this study, 1% of the mothers claimed that they were virgins when they gave birth. Whether there was some confusion about human biology or a re religious influence or some desperate attempt to, to keep a chastity pledge, I think each and every one of us would be skeptical of those claims if we understand what they're claiming. This is simply not how we're designed. However, during the season of Advent, we celebrate a story that says just that, that Jesus was born of a virgin. We just read from Matthew chapter 1, where an angel tries to convince Mary's fiancé that the same phenomenon has happened. Don't worry, she's still a virgin. Matthew points out, this was a fulfillment of prophecy. This was an expectation of, of who the Messiah would be. The people expected the Messiah to be born of a virgin. In verse 23, he quotes Isaiah 7, 14. That says just that. The question for us today is why is that so important for us to believe? Why was the Messiah to be born of a virgin? Why is this a tenet of our faith that's still vital for us to hold today? It goes far beyond just believing that God can do impossible things. That's what he tells Mary. It speaks to the very nature of who Jesus is and who Jesus came to be. So why is it important? Why is the virgin birth important to believe in? There's a lot of answers to that question. Because the virgin birth speaks to us of Jesus' humanity. It speaks of his sinlessness, which speaks to his ability to become our perfect sacrifice. And so if we really want to elaborate, the virgin birth becomes a core of our beliefs about the atonement, forgiveness, salvation, and ultimately our ability to spend eternity with God. It has far more far-reaching implications than we probably realize when we sing of it every Christmas. But as I wrote this and thought about it, there was one reason why the virgin birth is really important. Why the, especially 
in pertaining to the Christmas story. And I want to focus on that today. Because I want you to go back and read Matthew's quote of Isaiah, verse 23. Again, this is Isaiah 7, 14. It says, Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. We've been talking about the great expectations that the people in Jesus' day had for the Messiah. And we saw that in the genealogy last week. They expected him to be the son of David, son of Abraham. Expected these names in his family list. But then there were names that they would have never expected either. But the people of Jesus' day were expecting the Messiah to be born of a virgin. This was a normal expectation, pretty clear from this verse. This perhaps, they perhaps don't grasp how important that is, what the meaning of it is, but they expected it. In Luke 1, 34, when the angel comes to Mary, Mary says, how can this be? How can I be with child when I'm still a virgin? And the angel answers in verse 35, the Holy Spirit will fall upon her and the, the Most High will overshadow her. It's clear in the angel's response that Jesus, that God is the cause of her pregnancy. That God is what makes this impossible scenario impossible. He, he tells um, Joseph, the angel does in verse 20, the child within Mary is conceived by the Holy Spirit. What this means is that our belief in the virgin birth, is connected to our belief that Jesus is divine, that Jesus is God. But here's the thing. Everybody should have expected that. If they expected a virgin, a virgin birth, they should have expected Jesus to be God. Because look at what the prophecy says. A virgin will give birth to a son, and his name will be Emmanuel. And God is with us. The prophecy promised that God is coming to be with us. So what that means is that believing in the virgin birth is central to us believing that God came from heaven and made his dwelling here among us in Christ Jesus. Mary being a virgin is foundational to our understanding that, that Jesus is, was, and always will be God. Now the question for us is what does that really mean for us today? We celebrate at Christmas that God came to be with us but what should I expect in my life because God has come to be with us? Well, first, I mean, there's simply the reality that God is with us. Can't get any more clear as the scripture uses this exact phrase, a child being born of a virgin meant that God came to be with us. It was God leaving heaven to, to come to earth. It was God leaving glory to be humble. It was God leaving his throne to become a child. It was God leaving to become one of us, to be with us. This is a vital promise to our Christian faith. It is the promise that God will never leave us or forsake us, that they will actually become like us to, to make sure that everything that, that needed to be done was done so that we could be with Him. It is the promise that, that God understands what we're going through, that He doesn't view our hardships and pains and griefs from from golden streets in heaven, but he lived and experienced them on the dirt paths of earth. It means that God knows us. He knows our weaknesses. He knows temptation, that he knows grief, that he knows brokenness, that he knows pain, that he even knows death. God is with us means that God understands us, that God gets it. Second, it means that God is for us. What we are saying in this is that the God of heaven left everything behind. He left his throne. He left his glory. He left his home. And became like us, inevitably, to die like us. He did all that. He went through all that. He sacrificed all that so people like you and I could just have the chance to be saved from the consequences of our own bad choices. If God could do that for us, what wouldn't he do for us? God tells us that, that he is for us. That he always has been. That he always will be. And God with us demonstrates that that's true. Number three, it means that God can be known to us. That God can be known by us. John 1, 18 says, No one has ever seen God, but the unique one 
who is himself God, is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us, that the Word becoming flesh and making his dwelling among us revealed God to us. It's not just that God chose to reveal himself to us, but that God chose to reveal himself to us in humanity. From the beginning, God made man in his own image, revealing himself to each other through us. But in Jesus, God made himself fully known and again chose humanity to do that revealing. This should reinforce to us just how precious we are to God, how he sees us in spite of our apparent flaws and in spite of our brokenness. We are valuable to the God who has all, thi all things. He has revealed himself to us. And he's used us to reveal himself to us. Move on for a second from the earth-shattering notion that God left his throne. That God left heaven and became a human baby, diapers and all. Forget the audacity of our belief that, that a holy God was born in a feeding trough. Forget the outrageous faith that it takes to believe that God becomes human. And think for a second about what it means for you. Because God became a human so that we as humans could become like him. In fact, we have this expression, I'm only human. We've all heard it before. We, maybe we've even all used it before. We say it to justify our mistakes. I'm only human. I'm not perfect. It justifies our forgetfulness. I, I'm only human. I can't remember everything. Because to be human is to be flawed, to be imperfect. But I want you to understand that a child born of a virgin, Emmanuel, God with us, calls us to more than that. It doesn't just mean God came to be with us. It means something for us. It means we should be more than only human. God with us means that, that we do not have to be of this world. We can live above it and pursue a holy life filled with obedience, sacrifice, love, Grace, just like Jesus. God with us means that we're able to deny ourselves. That just as Jesus could humble himself, not only in being a baby born in a manger, but humble himself even to the point of death on a cross, we can deny ourselves and take up his cross and follow him. Denying ourselves means we live for each other and not for ourselves. God with us enables us to do that. God with us means that we do not have to love and live for the riches of this world. Jesus was, was able to give up the glory of heaven to become like us. So we can give up the things of this world to become like him. God becoming like us is the promise that we can become more like him. The God of heaven gave up all his glory. He gave up all his power. He gave up all his authority. He gave up his throne in heaven to be born of a virgin girl in a feeding trough in a no-name town with no fanfare or acclaim so that immediately the rulers of this world would want to and try to kill him. He would live a humble life of no glory or riches, a loving life that embraced the outcast and the downtrodden, teaching a message of love of God and others, healing and changing hearts and lives, only to be hated and despised for that. Only for the rulers of this world to finally su to succeed in killing him through the curse of a cross. And even after dying on the cross, God was with us. He conquered death and he rose from that tomb. God was born of a virgin to come to be with us. So that you could be born into a new life. So that you would have the hope of one day coming to be with him. Father God, we are humbled today. When we think of all you gave up for us, that you became like us. We ask today that we would embrace that that promise means that now we can become like you. That you taking on flesh means that our hearts and our lives can be changed forever. That we can one day take on new bodies to be with you. You came to be with us that we might one day get to be where you are. May we cling to that hope and may it bring us peace in this season. May it restore some of our brokenness. May it be a light in our darkness. 
God, may we embrace that Jesus was not just a man, but that Jesus was God. And that the Word was with God and the Word was God. That Word became flesh to show us who you are. You came that we might know you. So may that be the pursuit of our hearts and lives in this Christmas season. May God with us be the promise that we can know God and that we can be known by him. So work in our hearts and lives in this way today. May we know who you are. May we know that you're with us. May we know that you're for us. May we know that we can become like you. We pray all these things today. In the powerful name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Shall not kneel, shall not faint By his blood and in his name